grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Glad you could join us virtually once again as we celebrate the grace and love of our Lord. Let us turn to our first reading this morning, which comes from the seventh chapter of Paul's letter to the church in Rome, beginning with the 15th verse and proceeding through the first part of verse 25. Let us listen for the word of the Lord. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good. But in fact, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me, that is, in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self, but I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Our second reading comes from the 11th chapter of the Gospel according to Matthew, beginning with the 16th verse and proceeding through verse 19, and then picking up at verse 25 and proceeding through verse 30. Again, let us listen for the word of the Lord. But to what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We wailed and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking and they say he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking and they say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because <clears throat> you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Open now our hearts and minds, O God, by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit, so that as your word is proclaimed this day, we may hear with joy what it is you would have us hear that hearing we might believe, and that believing we might live lives of richer and fuller service, glorifying you here on earth as you are glorified in heaven. Amen. I've never been one to care about fashion. I don't keep track of the latest trends. I don't know what's hot and what's not. I couldn't name the top designers at present if my life depended on it. 
I've never put much stock in the belief that clothes make the man. Rather, it's what inside a person that really matters. So imagine my surprise this past week when I started thinking about fashion. It started when I was reminded of these words from the third chapter of Colossians. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. <clears throat> Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom and with gratitude in your hearts, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Those are verses 12 through 17 of the third chapter of Colossians. And I found myself thinking, people clothed with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, and love. Imagine that, because it's not what we are used to seeing each and every day, is it? Sure, we can all point to those instances where such things are exhibited, but I dare say that so much of what we see in the world today is just the opposite. So much of what we see in ourselves, if we are truly honest, is just the opposite. Little wonder then that Paul would write to the Christians in Rome, I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate, for I know that nothing good dwells within me, that is, in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it, for I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. One commentator noted that Paul has in view here the righteous and religious person, the responsible member of the human community, the one who wants to be a contributing member of society, yet despite every attempt to accomplish good for others and for self, the efforts of this person come to nothing. Ernst Kesemann succinctly summarized Paul's point in this passage when he wrote, what a person wants is salvation. What he creates is disaster. Sin's power is such that it corrupts even the best instincts and the most faithful religious person. Not surprisingly, then, God, uh, Paul would go on to write, Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? And the answer comes in a grand crescendo of praise. Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. What is impossible for us is accomplished by the grace of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. More than salvation is, is, is achieved in Jesus Christ, however, for in him we also find the wherewithal to live lives that glorify and are pleasing to God. In Christ Jesus, it is truly possible to clothe ourselves with compassion and kindness, humility and meekness, patience and love. But to do so, we cannot forget the most indispensable fashion accessory 
any Christian will ever wear, the yoke of Christ. Come to me, Jesus says, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Generations of believers have drawn comfort and hope from those words whenever we have felt overburdened by the cares and worries of life. But Jesus' intent in uttering these words was far different than the way that we have tended to interpret them. Paul Tillich wrote, Jesus does not tell us that he will ease the labors and burdens of life and work. How could he, even if he wanted to? Whether or not we come to him, the threats of illness or unemployment are not lessened. The weight of our work does not become easier. The fate of being a refugee driven from one country to another is not changed. The horror of ruins, wounds, and death falling from heaven is not stopped, and the sorrow over the passing of friends or parents or children is not overcome. Our Lord cannot and does not promise more pleasure and less pain to those whom he asks to come to him. On the contrary, sometimes he promises us more pain, more persecution, more threat of death, or the cross, as he calls it. What Jesus was referring to, however, was an alternative to all the burdens that the Pharisees were placing on people in order to have access to God. I find it quite telling that those who dismiss John the Baptist as having a demon because he was too strict and demanding oppose Jesus, calling him a glutton and a drunkard because he was, quote, too lenient, even going to the unspeakable extremes of dining with tax collectors and sinners and associating with unclean people. Those like the Pharisees and the towns which rejected Jesus's ministry, however, considered themselves to be wise. But what Jesus says in effect is that they are only fooling themselves if they think they can sit and wait for a Messiah who will fill their desires or play their games. Refusing to allow them to define how access to God would be granted or denied, Jesus then went on to say that he had come to reveal God to humanity. And it was in this context that he issued that glorious invitation, come to me. Interestingly, though, the one who was called a glutton and a drunkard because of his leniency often placed demands on people that went far above and beyond those emphasized even by the Pharisees. Just read the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapters 5 through 7 and you'll see what I mean. Because in those chapters, Christ's teachings are frequently presented in the formula, you have heard that it was said, but I say to you, and that turn of phrase serves to ratchet up his call to action toward what some have rightly called an impossible ethic of loving enemies, praying for persecutors, and giving everything to beggars. So we should not be all that surprised to hear Jesus invite us to take his yoke upon ourselves. The yoke has traditionally been a symbol of servitude, of surrendering our lives to the direction and leading of God. The yoke image completely eliminates the possibility of the Christian spectator. The yoke is not optional dress for the Christian. It is indeed the indispensable part of clothing ourselves in Christ. Because while a yoke is 
a symbol of the loss of freedom, the great paradox of our faith is that only by surrendering ourselves to God can we claim that we are truly free. Moreover, we are promised that our Lord joke is easy. I think that that is a somewhat unfortunate translation of the Greek, however, because easy tends to imply a simple, carefree, happy-go-lucky existence. And as we have seen, this is not what Jesus promised. It is nevertheless easier than any of the burdens that the Pharisees might have sought to place on the people. But the Greek word translated here as easy may better be translated as suitable. In other words, the yoke of Christ fits us perfectly. It's custom made for each one of us. When I was in seminary, I heard about a wonderful legend concerning Jesus during the years prior to his public ministry. It obviously didn't make it as part of our scripture, but the legend claims that Jesus, after learning the trade of carpentry from Joseph, became one of the master yoke builders in Nazareth, and that people would come from miles around for him to hand carve and craft a yoke made by Jesus. It said that when customers arrived with their team of oxen, Jesus would spend considerable time measuring both of them, their height, their width, the space between them as they stood side by side, the size of their shoulders. And within a week, the team would be brought back and he would carefully place the newly made yoke over the animal's shoulders, watching for rough places, smoothing out the edges, and fitting them perfectly to this particular team of oxen. Now again, this was only a legend, but I think it does speak to the fact that our Lord's yoke is custom made for each one of us. Moreover, the one with whom we are teamed in this particular yoke is our Lord himself. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, he says, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus tells each and every one of us, this is how you will learn to clothe yourselves in compassion and love by learning from me. This invitation to learn from Christ means more than simply listening to his teachings, though that is very important. From him, disciples were to learn not merely to think, but to do. They were to learn to listen, and to watch. In this word, Jesus may be saying, become my yoke mate and learn how to pull the load by working beside me and watching how I do it. The heavy labor will seem lighter when you allow me to help you with it. When we are yoked to Jesus, we learn that all people are loved and forgiven that God delights in all humanity and that there is nothing that can separate any of us from God's love. We learn that the greatest command is to love God with our whole being and that the second greatest is to love our neighbor as ourselves. We learn to be creative in finding ways to include people rather than rushing to exclude them. We learn that though it is often brutish and nasty, God still views this world as a beautiful place worth redeeming, and that even in the face of the terrible evil in our midst, God is committed to making things right again. And God calls on us to be a part of establishing a new heaven and a new earth. 
we learn that God is to be found in the lives of those who suffer and mourn and struggle under the weight of sin and injustice and calls us to be found there alongside them. We learn under our Lord's direction to do the good we want to do instead of the evil we don't. In short, we learn that the yoke of Christ is indispensable if we are ever to clothe ourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, and love. To God be all the honor, glory, and praise forever. Amen.